through um, our lessons on um, <clears throat> the divine attributes of the Creator. And we talked uh, last week, talked one of the divine attributes of God is, is God is long suffering. And uh, that turned out really well. But we're going to take a little bit of a detour. I've been um, uh, plowing into this lesson over about a week now, maybe a little bit more than a week. And uh, one of the things that uh, I got out of this is God is a preserver. God is a preserver. Now, if you see, we did this on a previous lesson here. Um, God is creator. We have it here. God, when we talked about God is creator, we talked also, all, we went through all these scriptures right here. God is a sustainer. He's a provider, but he's also a destroyer. One day he's going to burn it all up to a crisp. That means all the, the baby whales and giraffes and everything else is going to go poof one day, right? Amen? And so God is able to create it, but he's able to destroy it, right? And uh, so the creator has power to create and sustain as well as power to destroy. And so one of the things that brings an importance to what Christ said here in Luke 12, 5, you get a, if you get a grip on what he said here, but I forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And so, Lord, so we, get, we understand the power of God Almighty, but it's a power that is under restraint. If God just let loose, there would nothing be left. It would be instantaneous destruction. Okay? And we talked about how God has this long suffering um, characteristic that's beyond my comprehension. And He's able to, uh, to, to endure. The, the centers of this planet and the, throughout the, all the generations, I mean, look at what Israel did to him. And, and over and over again, God continually just strives with men. He strives with them to get saved. He strives with Israel. He's striving right now with this crazy world in which we live in, especially this, this country and the mess that it's in right now. Well, Don and I was just talking about it. some of the stuff that's going on. It's just incredible. And yet, God is in restraint. See, he's all powerful, he's all knowing, he's all understanding. But at the same time, he has the power to be long suffering. And he says, My hand is stretched out still. Whosoever shall, whosoever will, come, come and take the hand and take the water of life freely, right? And so we're going to see him uh, do, be doing that same thing during the tribulation period. All right, let's look at Job now. One thing about Job, there's some, there's some good stuff in there that, uh, pertaining to this lesson, especially in Job 38 and through uh, 39. Now, I'm not going to read those whole two chapters. But I picked out excerpts of each one of those chapters, and we're gonna, I'm going to confirm what, uh, what, what the, uh, the central uh, uh, point of the lesson tonight is. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with Job chapter 7. Job 7, 20 says this, and this is at towards when, when he was going through a lot of stuff there, and, and he was really messed up, and I, I sympathize with him, man. I mean, he was in a bad way. He said, I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee? He's talking to God. O thou preserver of man. So he confirmed right there that his knowledge was that God is a preserver of the souls of men, right? Okay. Why hast thou set me as thy mark against me, against thee, so that I am a burden to myself? So even in Job's time of life, not too far removed from the flood of Noah, this concept of God as preserver of men is known by the righteous souls of that era. So this thing, remember the a lesson we taught quite a while back that God is, is he's not left without a witness. He, we talked all the way through the flood, from Adam all the way until the very end during the millennium, God always reserved to himself some kind of a witness of God, all right? And so Job was, a, a, was one of these premier witnesses, okay? And, and so, although one may seem to detect some sarcasm in Job's statement above, it does reveal a reality that God does preserve mankind. He preserves men. But not only does he preserve you, as born again Christians. Not only does he preserve mankind itself, but we're also going to see that he preserves his own creation, right? God holds all things together by the word of his power, and he's a preserver, not only of men, but he's a preserver of all that he creates. So, I did a word search on these words here, and uh, I thought it was pretty good. Psalms 37 20, for the Lord loveth judgment and forsaken not his saints. They are preserved forever. But see, the wicked shall be cut off. First Thessalonians 5 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body. There it is. Tripart being a man. Man is a trinity, composed of three parts, right? Be preserved blameless into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's your promise from God. He's going to preserve you. He's going to preserve you, your soul. He's going to preserve your body until it's time to be put 
take a dirt nap, right? He's going to preserve you in every capacity as a saint of God, all right? So that's your promise. We're going to get into that a little bit further. That's just a, a tidbit. Jude 1 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. You're in Christ. Therefore, you're not going to lose it. You can't lose your salvation. You're preserved in Christ. You're in Him. He's in you, and the thing is sealed, right, by the Holy Spirit of promise. All right? So look at Strong's here. We took a look at that word preserved here. To attend to carefully, to take care of. Now, when I see that, I kind of kind of look at it like a shepherd over his flock. He's watching that flock. He's watching for the for the predators to come and, and overthrow his flock. He's watching for the ones that are sick. He's watching for the ones that are straight. You know, that's what your father is. He's a shepherd over you, and he's preserving your life right now. He has a purpose for each and every one of us, and he preserves us with that calling. So he says right there, and call. We're called to be sons of God, but we're also called to do a work for the Lord. We're also called to exercise the gifts that he's given us to edify the body of Christ in its fullness. Not just me, myself, and I. I'm here to get what I can get. I'm here to go and help you. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to love you. I'm here to take care of you. That's what I'm here. I'm a servant. You're a servant too, folks. We serve each other. You want to know how you serve Christ? You serve Christ by serving him, serving her, serving him. You serve your brothers and sisters. That's how you serve Christ. All right? So, let's sit here and look at these uh, right here. It says, to guard. I like that word there, to guard. Uh, from loss of injury uh, and by keeping an eye upon. Them. See that? And then right here, which implies a fortress or full military lines of apparatus. Amen to that one. You got, you got the full military apparatus of heaven standing by your side, right? Okay? I like that one. All right, John 17, 2, here's another good one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And I haven't lost anybody. He's not going to lose anybody, right? So God's preserving you, the believer of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 4, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, is reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. So you got not only are your, is your soul kept by the power of God, but your inheritance is kept and preserved by the power of God. Okay? And that's saying something. All right? Let's go a little bit further here now. I like that word kept. It says the same, basically the same thing. To guard, protect by military guard. See? Either prevent hostile invasion or to keep inhabitants of the besieged city from flight. That sort of thing. I like this one here. To hem in and protect. Right? All right? So Philippians 4, 7. In the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's that word there. All right, so let's look at purpose, preservation, and deliverance. These two are connected. I noticed this when I was going through these scriptures now. Preservation, think about it now. Preservation and deliverance. Preservation and deliverance. They're connected. All right, Psalms 51 8. Make me to hear joy and the gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. So in the following passages, we see through the experience of these saints how that God deals with us individually as a process of purging and spiritual growth. And then afterwards, there is deliverance when once the objective is achieved. One of the things that we understand as we mature in the faith and we go on with the Lord bearing our cross daily, he's going to put us through many disagreeable circumstances in order to get us where he wants us so that he can do with us what he needs to do. And a lot of times, believers get all upset with God and they say I don't want to fool with it anymore and they suffer shipwreck in their faith and then God puts them on the shelf. Some people he can take back off the shelf. I'm a perfect example of that. One of those days way back I told God no I'm not going to do it and then God said okay have at it and it cost me 13 years of my life folks it ain't worth it I'd do anything to get that 13 years back. My brother here been doing this 30, what is it, 38 years Start at 37 next week. No, 30, 30 years. Look, just think 38 years, man. And he's got something I can never have. So, the fact of the matter is, if God's called you to do something, don't tell him no. He don't force his hand and say, Okay, I'm going to have to put you through this, this, and this, and it gets you to say, Okay, yes, Lord, thy will be done. And so, we see that all the time here. Look at Job 5 18. Of course, he makes the sword. That's God talking. It's God. He maketh sore and he bindeth up. Isn't that something? He woundeth and his hands make whole. Isn't that something? He heals the broken heart and bindeth up their wounds. 
Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again, and he has led me alive again, and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Now you understand what happened to Job. We all read Job, we all understand what went on with that poor fellow. Look, folks, we don't have necessarily to go through such a harsh experiences if we would just be obedient from the beginning. But you know that old sin nature rises up sometimes. It wants to do its own thing. It's got its own ideas. It's going to go its own way. You know, if you're saved, God's not just going to take his hands off and let you perish most of the time. <laughs> Some people are pretty hard-headed. But the fact of the matter is, God will put us through certain things, and if he has to break the bones to get your attention, then that's what he's got to do. But guess what? He will preserve your life, he will preserve your soul, and he's gonna bind up those broken bones. And when you come out on the other side, you'll be much stronger and you'll be saying, yes, Lord, not my will be done, but thine will be done, amen? Through obedience, Lord, he was suffering the things that he suffered. Okay, Hosea 6, 1. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. We saw that in Israel all the time, constantly going through this with Israel over and over and over again. He would, he would chasten them, with the with the scourge of war and captivity and some of the most awful things that he had to put them through throughout all those years but he he healed them he brought them back up you know what he's still struggling with them even today and guess what he's going to be struggling with them during the tribulation period <laughs> you know but one day god's word's going to come it's going to come to pass and their hearts are going to be towards their messiah right but not now psalm 34 19 many are the afflictions of the righteous but he but the lord delivered them out of them all and of course, you see a lot of these others here. I'm not going to go through every one of these. These are all good, talking about Paul and some of the stuff that he's gone through. All right, so we consider Job. And James tells us consider Job. He says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at the purpose here. All right, so we're looking at Christ as God's Son, but we're looking also at the believing saint. All right, Hebrews 5, 8. Though he were a son, yet earned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Okay, and of course we know the scriptures that say, uh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. As Christ suffered in the flesh, you're going to suffer in the flesh. Okay, the believing saint, 1 Peter 5, 10. But the God of all grace who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthened, set Nowhere in that does it say that you perish. Nowhere. You know what that means? God preserves you through the trials. He preserves you through the sufferings. He preserves you through the chastenings that he has to put you through, right? He does, all right? So let's go ahead a little bit further. The preservation of his words. Now one of the things you guys know, you know my stand, you know where I am. This book right here, the King James Bible, is the preserved word of God, right? And so God preserves his words. And we're gonna go a little bit further with this and talk about what his word accomplished from the very beginning. And he preserves it. Now watch this, Psalms 12, 6. Watch what it says here. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. There's that word keep. O Lord, thou shalt, what's that say? It says preserve, doesn't it? Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. All right, that is profound. And I'm gonna show you why it's so profound here in just a second. Let that sink in. All right, preservation of his creation by his words. Look at Hebrews 1, 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by what? The preserved word of God, the word of his power. Okay, Psalms 119, look at what it says there. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances. Now, that's a word that we need to look at because that's talking about the laws of God. Okay, that's talking about the laws of God. So what we're going to have here now is we're going to talk about how the Word of God, the laws of God, preserve His creation. Now take a look at this. After God spoke the world into existence, then God as Creator established the continuation of His creation 
with ordinances, or you can say universal laws, right? Which continually govern and preserve the order and function of his creation. Okay? So, the word of God upholds all things. The law of creation upholds the creation itself. The creation, that what I'm trying to get at is the creation is created by the word of God. God spoke it. But God also developed divine ordinances or divine laws that govern that creation. Now, I'm going to expand upon this point here in just a second. Job 33, 38. And 38, 33. Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Now, this is Job when he was being asked questions by God Almighty. Okay? And you, you guys are familiar with that. And so God answers Job in return. And one of the things that's interesting about what God says to Job is, knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? He's saying, okay, Job, you want to question me? Then you tell me about the divine laws of the universe that I governed the universe with when I spoke the worlds into existence. Let that sink in for a second. We want to question God, why God, why God, why God? And you're dealing with someone who set up universal laws to govern the planets, to govern the seasons of the earth, to govern everything that he spoke into existence. Even the speed of light has a, universe, has a law regarding it. Gravity has a quote-unquote law regarding it. See what I'm saying? And here he is telling Job, I'm the one who set up the laws for the universe that I created all right, Jeremiah 33, 25, thus saith the Lord, if my covenant be not with uh, day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob, etc., etc. That's right there. It's a promise he's going to preserve Israel. He says it right there, right? That means if, if, if his divine laws that govern the universe ever dissipate and go away, then he will forsake Israel. That ain't gonna happen, folks. All this replacement theology foolishness you see going on, there is so, the scriptures that refute that are legion. I see them every time I'm reading the book. I'm reading it and reading it. I said, there's another, there's another, there's another. There's so many scriptures to overthrow that stuff. Okay? Of course, I'm preaching the choir. You guys know that. All right. So let's look at what it says here: ordinances. Statute, ordinance, limit, enactment, something prescribed. Okay? So I took a, uh, a look at Webster's uh, 1828 Dictionary and uh, it says right here, an act, this is a, this is a worldly definition, not a, not a biblical one, but it, it, it lends credence to what I'm saying here. An act of the legislature of a state that extends its binding force to all citizens or subjects of that state as distinguished from an act which extends only to an individual or company. All right, and so look at what it says right here. Statutes are distinguished from common law. So if you read Blackstone's commentaries, you can get all this kind of stuff. But the fact of the matter is there's statutes and there's common law. The latter, or common law, owes its binding force to the principles of justice so long the use and the consent of the nation. The former, which is statutes, owe their binding force to a positive command or declaration, words, of the supreme power. In this case, it would be what? The Supreme Court or the judicial, whatever, or the state, whatever. But in the, in the order of God's universe, the supreme law or the supreme judge is who? God Almighty. And so he sets up these ordinances and laws of which our petty little things here on this earth are just a, a shadow of a more truer reality that is universal, folks. All right? We're just seeing a little bitty piece of it. Not much at all, actually. All right, so in monarchies, the laws of the sovereign are edicts, decrees, ordinances, etc., etc. Okay, so with that clarification, let's take a look at what it says right here. God is lawful by his very nature. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Law is a requirement with prescribed boundaries. The Ten Commandments, for example, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's a good example. Okay, now here's the point I want to get across. Let this sink in. Pay attention to this. The laws of God's creation is visible. Gravity, 
I can take a ball, throw it in the air. I can watch it come down. It's visible, isn't it? I can go on that beach and I can look at the waves of that sea and those waves go no further than that beach. Amen? God's physical laws of the universe say that wave will stay here and come no further. Okay? The same thing, I can look at that sun and I know it's coming up there and it's going to go down there. The moon's going to follow it like that. I know it's going to happen. That's a divine ordinance of heaven. I can see it with my eyes and I can look at that and I can say, who did that? You know that creation is a witness? Remember we did that study on God as a witness in every age? That creation is a witness. And if a man's, if a man has never heard the word of Jesus Christ, if he's honest and follows his conscience, I'm convinced God will get the gospel to that person somehow, some way. He yeah. will get it to them. See, the law of conscience is in every man. In order to kill an unborn child in a mother's womb, that conscience has to be seared beyond repair. Mm -hmm. But if a man is honest and he knows that murder is wrong, I mean, even a heathen in the jungle has never even heard the word of God knows that a murder is not right because his conscience tells him so, right? And so if a man is honest and follows his conscience, God's going to get the gospel to him. The problem is the heart is deceitful above, above all things and desperately wicked who can know it, all right? So there's the problem. All right, so let's take a look at this now. The laws of God's creation is visible. The laws of God's righteousness is invisible. You say, how so? I can't see the laws of God's righteousness. God is invisible. He's invisible. I can see the results of his righteousness, okay? You folks sitting in this church right now are reading the Bible or studying the Bible or giving uh, tithes and offerings or witnessing and winning souls or, or doing this or doing that for missionaries, whatever. That's a visible manifestation of God's righteousness and his law, right? Okay? But I can't see it like I can see that ball go up there and fall down. So it's invisible. So guess what God had to do? He had to make it visible somehow. Anybody following me? All right. So let's take a look at this now. The animal kingdom cannot discern between good and evil. For example, a cow does not have a conscience. Amen. He has no conscience whatsoever. Right. But a human being does. We're separated from animals because we have a capacity to understand good from evil. Man, on the other hand, created in the image of God, has the built-in capability to discern by his conscience that which is righteous and that which is evil. And we know that from Romans 2.15, 2, right? I mean, yeah, 2.15. So, for example, we have the ordinance of marriage established by the word of God from the very beginning, when man was made from the earth and the woman was made from the man. A man is to have one woman to be his wife for life, okay? And so God made laws to govern marriage. Now, I can't see the law per se, the law of righteousness. The law of marriage is the law of righteousness. The righteousness of God. I can't see it per se, but I can see the results of it. You see? I can see the husband and wife staying together their entire lives and, and loving each other and taking care of each other. I can see that. That's a result of God's law being manifested visibly through people, right? And so God wrote it down for us. He sure did. Genesis 2, 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now that's the righteous God, law of God being written down so that anybody can read it who is literate and can read it. And if they can't read it, they can hear it. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Amen? Mark 10, 5 through 9, Jesus answered said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote this precept, but from the beginning of the creation of God made he them male and female. For this cause, of, and he goes on and quotes it, all right? And so the idea here is, is that the law of God from an invisible God, it means invisible to our fleshly eyes and all that, can be manifested by being written down, whereas the laws of creation of the creator himself can be visibly seen, okay? Now, let's go back and look at this now. Anything outside of that prescribed boundary is outside of the law of marriage. Those sinners that practice anything outside of that prescribed boundary of the law of marriage set up by God, the creator of man and woman, are lawless. Or in modern parlance, 
They are outlaws. See that? That means they're outside of God's laws, his established laws. They're outlaws. Okay? God, the creator of man and woman, alone. Okay, so that we now see that God, God's preservation of all his creation is predicated upon universal laws set up by him that govern every facet of his universe. Okay, so we see this in Nehemiah 9 6. Take a look at Nehemiah 9 6 here. Thou, even thou, O Lord, alone, our Lord alone, thou hast made heaven and, and the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. Watch it now. Thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. How does he preserve them? By his word. What is his word? He sets up divine, universal laws that govern his universe. Psalm 36, 6. The righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep, O Lord. Thou preservest man and beast. See that? Man and beast. All right? So, the first laws of God Almighty were spoken. Of course, we know Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and God said. There it is right there. See that? God said. Right? Words. Words, right? Let there be light. And it was so. There was light. Look at John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, note the capital, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's that talking about? One of you Bible scholars in here tell me. Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? He is the Word. <clears throat> and He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and all by him all things consist. See that? Watch this now. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without, uh, without him was not anything made that was made. Then the word of God was born as a man to declare the invisible laws of God of righteous, God's righteousness to man. You know how I know that? It says it right there, John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh. So what you have now is, the way God worked this thing out, it's just truly amazing, just boggles my mind in thinking about it. God manifests in the flesh and comes and declares to man his divine laws of righteousness. Man can see the creation, and he knows it's a creation. He has a conscience. He knows, principally speaking, good from evil. But he was lacking something. He was lacking a knowledge of God's righteousness. And so what did God do? He sent his son, and his son revealed the laws of God's righteousness to mankind. Man, I got goosebumps. Okay, so some examples of the visible laws of creation. Let's take a look at this now. The law that governs the seasons, okay? So God sets up these laws when he created things. Genesis 1, 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And so, it, and it was so, okay? So those are visible creation laws that are set up and even unto this day, we can sit up there and look at them and they're visible. We can know that God did that, right? The law of the sea, look at Job 38, 8. Now, get a chance to read 38, 8, and 9, 39, and just sit there and just soak it in. There's so much in there because God is displaying to Job his divine nature, his lawfulness, and how he set things up. Look at what it says here in the law of the sea. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and now shall thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in search of the depth? So there is a law that governs the seasons. There is a creation law that governs the sea. The law of the rain. How many of y'all know there is a law that governs rain? It sure is. Look at this. Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing waters, or a way for the lightning, the thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness wherein is, there is no man, to satisfy the desolate waste ground and to cause the blood of the tender herb to spring forth, hath the rain a father, or who hath begotten the drops of dew? You realize God preserves all of his creation through these divine laws? 
the divine law of rain. The law of the stars and galaxies. Cast out, bind the sweet influences of Pleiades. That's a pop constellation of fair in the sky. And loose the bands of Orion. That's another constellation. Cast out, bring forth Maseroth in his season. Cast out God, Arcturus, and his sons. Notice now the ordinance. Look. Ordinances of heaven. Cast thou set the dominion thereof in the earth. You see that? The divine laws of creation. We can see them. Okay. Here's another good one with the animal kingdom. Law of the animal kingdom. Wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion or fill the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens and abide to covert to lie in the wake? Who provided for the raven his food? When his young ones cry unto God, they wander for lack of meat. Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth and cast thou a mark when the eyes do calf? These are all laws that govern God creation. Every one of them, folks. Are laws that God set up. Doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom and stretch her wings towards the south? Doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock in the strong place. From thence she seeketh the prey, and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up the blood, and where they're slain off, there is she. And so you've got these divine laws that are visible, that are the laws of creation. Now let's talk about the law of righteousness. Remember, we said that the divine laws of creation are, are physical and visible and that any heathen in any jungle and any place on the face of the earth can look at those things and say, who did that? And if he follows his conscience, God will get the missionary to him. Now, let's look at the law of righteousness. This makes a more perfect way, a more perfect understanding. Watch this. The law of God's righteousness. The ordinance of God's creation can be seen and observed with the eyes, but the law of God's righteousness is something else altogether. Then the words of God and his laws of his righteousness were written on the earth for man to keep and to obey, so bringing forth fellowship with God. So what we have here now is, of course, you know the story. You got fallen man. The very first thing that man did was he disobeyed God's law. Thou shalt not eat. And he ate, and he broke the law, and guess what happened? Chaos ensued. Where the law is broken and not kept, chaos ensues. That is a universal law. So, let's take a look at this now. Deuteronomy 9, 10. And the, word, and the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words of the Lord had spake. And that's talking about the Ten Commandments, right? So the law was written by the finger of God. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai, rose up from Mount Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Haran, and he came with 10,000 of the saints from his right hand when a fiery law full of them. Okay, so what we have now is with the establishment of Israel coming out of Egypt, God established a nation to be a testimony and a witness to his divine revelation of the righteous laws of God that were invisible. Okay, and so what happened was God used Israel to uh, to write His law down and give it to mankind. Okay, as a, as a as a as a prelude to the true Word of God that was going to come later. But what that law and commandments did, principally speaking, was it established before mankind just how righteous God really is. That his righteousness by mortal man is absolutely unattainable. There is nobody on this earth except one man who ever kept all ten of them commandments his whole life from birth to death. Okay? So what that law did when it was written, it posed sort of a problem, if you want to put it that way. Man was no longer without excuse. He couldn't say, I didn't know. He had details that he never had before. And so therefore, that law displayed the true righteousness of God the Father, the standard that is impossibly higher than anything or any fallen man could ever attain it to. And so what did that do? That necessitated someone to come in the flesh and fulfill and keep the law perfectly and die in your place because he kept the law for you. You see how God works? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. All right? So let's take a look at this now. Go a little bit further here. So by default, 
we can confidently say that the laws of God for the universe and for man are there for the preservation of both. When those laws are exceeded or broken, then the dissolution of God's order proceeds unto destruction. In the case of man, physical death and eternal damnation in hell. Now, one of the things that we understand here is that I don't know if anybody has been in a lawless society, but I've read plenty of books about it, especially particularly concerning war zones where there is no law. And then it's starting to get that way in our cities in America, and it's that way across the border in Mexico right now. We, as Americans, we don't understand a world without law. We don't have understanding about man's laws and how it restrains the evil nature of some people. Take that away. Like me and my brother was talking about a while ago. You take that away and the atrocities become unspeakable. So God is a lawful God. He's also a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. Nor is he a God of confusion. And if the laws are abandoned and broken, what ensues is chaos, desolation, and confusion. You can count on it every single time throughout all of history. It is it's without fail. That is a universal principle that cannot be undercut in any way. So, let's look at this word desolation here. We'll take a look at it right quick. In a general sense, the separation of the parts of a body which in the natural structure are united. Okay, So basically you have two things together and they come apart. Right? So if you have humanity coming together, then you have a lawless society. The society, the society breaks down and comes apart. It's every man for himself. The law of the jungle. I kill you before you kill me. I kill an eat before you can kill an eat. Me first, you, you last. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. That's the law of the jungle. And that's what's coming on this earth during the tribulation period. All right? And we know that because they call him the Antichrist the lawless one. Right? All right? And so you go on and he talks about here, but we speak so of desolation of flesh or animal bodies when the parts separate by future passions, talking decomposition, all the, all the proteins. Once the life goes out of the body, the proteins decompose to their natural elements. Okay? And that's decomposition. All right? That's a perfect example of what lawlessness produces. You know, death. You know, death. Lawlessness produces death. And so, what we have here is a type of what the lake of fire is going to be like. It's going to be dissolution and chaos where there is no order. There is no <coughs> All the divine attributes of God Mercy, love, joy, peace, long suffering, and nothing to do. Don't exist. There's no laws out there. So the destruction of a soul due to lawlessness, disobedience to the gospel of Christ, is a default judgment for breaking God's law. So what we're going to see here now. So in effect, lawlessness results in chaos. And if you look at the definition of it, it says confusion. See that? Confusion. Any mixed mass without due form or order. Disorder. See that? A state in which the parts are indistinguished. So when God's laws are ignored, bar none, the results are chaos. During the tribulation period, they will actually get to the point where they will destroy all life on earth because they are lawless being led by the lawless one. And we see that in Revelation 11, 18. It says it right there. Look what it says. And the nations were angry, and etc., etc. Look what it says right here. To the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Matthew 24, 22 is a tribulation passage. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Look at Daniel 7, 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. He's the lawless one. He's the Antichrist. 
you're looking at something right here, a prophecy that the world is going to come to the point where they so ignore and break all of God's laws to the point where if Jesus Christ didn't come back, not one stitch of life would be left on this planet. I don't know how they do it, whether nuclear holocaust or what, but he says it right there. If he didn't come back, everything would be exterminated. And you know what they're trying to do now? They're trying to save the earth. They're trying to, they're trying to do all these things, you know. And you know what God says? You, you try, you're breaking my laws. You're going against my righteousness. And you think you're going to save yourselves. And you're fixing to damn the whole earth. You're going to damn your souls. You're going to damn the whole earth. That's where the whole earth is headed right now. Okay? So, let's, see, let's use the example of long marriage again. All right? Go back to that. Because that's what's under attack in this country right now. Leviticus 18.23 Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shalt thou any woman stand before a beast to lie down there, there too. What does that say? It is confusion. What is that? That's breaking God's law of marriage. Leviticus 20.12 And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrong. Wrong what? Confusion. The breaking of God's law results in desolation and confusion. All right? It says it right there. Confusion, perversion, as in sexual sin. So let me ask you a question, folks. What do you think is going to happen to this nation if we keep going down the path we're going? Mm -hmm. Good. Good bad. Good bad. And I say this all the time. I'll say it again. Whatever you got, God got you to do right now, you better do it quick. I don't think we have much time. If we don't have much time for the rapture, we have a little bit of time for the rapture, I don't think we have much time for the stable government, quite honestly. I don't think we got much time before they knock in on the doors and pull the preachers out, put them in handcuffs and haul them off. The way things are going right now. I don't mean to be so dreadful and all, but I'm just being realistic. When a nation breaks God's laws like we're doing right now, not only breaking them, but mocking Jesus Christ openly, mocking marriage, mocking God, you, I don't I don't understand it. Like we talked about last week, long stuff from God is beyond my comprehension. I'd have burned this place to a crisp a long time ago for me. But I'm not God and I'm glad. Amen. Alright, so first that's first Corinthians um 1433. For God is not the author of what? Confusion. God is a lawful God. Alright? So we see it here. It, confusion in this instance and in, in the Greek is instability, a state of disorder, disturbance, confusion. Okay, so that's the results. So we can now understand that the law of God's creation preserves the creation that he spoke by his word into existence. Therefore, the law of God's righteousness preserves man from the destruction of his body and soul. Okay, so let's talk about preserver. Get back to the main theme of the lesson here. Preserver of Israel. Okay, I'm under time constraint, so I'm not going to be able to read all of that right there. You can read that on your own time. But look at Psalms 121.7. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. Isaiah 31, 5. As a bird flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. All right, look at uh, uh, Isaiah 40, 49, 8. He says it right here. And I will preserve thee. Deuteronomy 6, 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, statutes, laws, the law of God's righteousness, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. And watch this. That he might preserve us alive. The keeping of God's laws of righteousness, okay, preserves the man, just like the laws of the universe preserve God's creation. Y'all with me? You see how that works? All right? So, we see God's hand preserving the seed of the woman all the way through to the last days of the great tribulation period and into the millennium. God always reserved to himself a remnant out of Israel, which seed shall continue even through the tribulation period, and the progeny from that small remnant will populate the millennial earth. We talked about that last week. All right, And so this is just more confirmation passages that God has not forsaken Israel. Okay, I just want to throw that in there. So he's a preserver of the souls of the saints. And this is Old and New Testament, but we're going to talk about New Testament saints particularly because we're the body of Christ in the church. Okay? Eternal security. This is a big topic. It's 
just like the rapture thing, it's a big topic. But eternal security, we're going to talk about that right now. 2 Timothy 4 8. And the Lord shall deliver me, Paul, from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. All right? Paul's talking about himself. What he did was he came to an understanding and a conclusion uh, that, that all saints are preserved in Jesus Christ. You are preserved, you're called, and Paul got a good glimpse of understanding this to consider all the stuff that he went through, right? And he understood it experientially. He didn't just read it like we do from the Bible. He understood it experientially that God's delivered. Have you ever experienced God's deliverance experientially, right? That's the best kind of experience to have. I can read this book all day long and it might come alive to me, but until I've experienced what Job went through, or I've experienced what Paul went through, or I've experienced the Word of God and the promises, it's a whole different dynamic going on here. See? It becomes a part of you. Your experience with God becomes a part of you. And so, therefore, every experience that you go through that exalts the righteousness of God by, by, by Him revealing His righteous law in your life, through your, through your life, you realize that one day that's going to be a reflection in eternity. One day, you're going to be an open book of God's mercy, of God's love, of His long-suffering, of His joy, of His peace, of His deliverance. How many other divine attributes are, Brother Lee? About 20 or 30 or 40? There's a whole bunch there, isn't it? And so every time we go through these things with God, experiencing the just God preserving his saints as he promised, that's a testimony to God and the angels in heaven. All of the all of creation. And so, folks, they're watching you. The angels are looking down and they're watching you. One day, you're going to be a testimony and a glory of all, to all of creation. Isn't that something? And so, we know also that deliverance and preservation go hand in hand, but there is also provision, as in the case of Israel in the wilderness. So not only will God preserve your soul, right? He will also make provision. Not only will he preserve your soul and he will bind up the wounds and deliver you, but he will also give you provision and sustainability through the trial. How many of you feel like you may need that? You see what I mean? All right, so it all goes together. All right, so uh, the church age saint is likewise, spiritually speaking, in a desolate and hostile wilderness, which is a type of the fallen world. Paul spoke of a promise given by God to all of his saints. Look at Philipp uh, uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. It's Christ, right? And look, but my God shall supply all you need, see? For the Lord God is a son and a shield. No good thing will he hold with them that walk upright. See that? That's complicity with his righteous his laws of righteousness. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusts in thee. Okay? And so, according as his divine power hath given to us all things, see, all things through Christ. Right? So God is, he provides. According as his divine power hath given to us all things. There it is again. Exceeding great precious promises. Because thou defendest them. My defense is of God over and over again. You see these confirmations over and over and over again. So God is a is a is a is a is a, um, a preserver, but He's also a sustainer. Okay, here's some more good ones here. Thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of trouble. He is my defense; I shall not be moved. That's a song, isn't it, Bo? That's a song. I shall not be moved. All right. So we see that God will strengthen. Right? He's going to strengthen. God will preserve. God will deliver. God will supply. And God will defend you. Christ is our sufficiency in all things spiritual and material, just as it was for Israel in the wilderness. And he says it right there. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always... having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. So there is a purpose behind God giving you his sufficiency and his preservation and his deliverance. It's so that you can bear much fruit to his glory. That's what he's looking for. God wants a return on his investment. 
Doesn't it? Don't take your talent, put it in a napkin, and keep dirt over it. Take it and get it used for God so that he gets a return on his investment unto you. Bound with every good work. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made into us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So there's your supply. Everything you need is, is there. Now, does that mean that God won't let you sweat it out for a little while? Well, before he comes to your rescue? Oh, yeah, he, he can do that too. But let's be realistic. Faith can't be exercised unless we're put into the impossible situations. You see that over and over. I mean, the older you get, the more you realize, you know, how am I going to get out of this? Well, God get me out of it. I don't know how many times I've been there and said, this is impossible. <laughs> and then just happens, you see. That's the way God works, see. But you know what that is? That's exercising of your faith. And so we kick and scream sometimes, get all upset and say, oh, God, woe is me, woe is me, you know. But then you get to realize when you look back and it's all over and God has delivered you and he's bound up the broken bones and you're looking back and you say, now I see what he just did. Yeah, I've been there a few times. It's wonderful. It's rough going through it. It's rough. But when you get back out and you see what God did, you're like, they couldn't have done it no other way. Just like Jesus Christ could not have done it any other way. He had to go through that cross. It couldn't have done any other way. And it's likewise with you. God has a certain way and a certain path that you have to go through, and it won't work any other way. But once you get through it, and you look back, and he binds up the wounds, he heals you, and he sets you on high, and he, and he, and he can use you, then you say, Glory to God. Glory to God. That's what I want to do. That's what we all should want. All right? So, and he said with Paul here, for which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed. That's another song. I know in whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. All right? All right, so, I'm going to get the rest of these, but, yeah, let me do this too right here. In time of trouble, he'll deliver you in time of trouble. Uh, Psalm 32, 7, he'll preserve you in time of trouble. Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt preserve me from trouble. And then from persecution of the wicked, of course, you know, that sort of thing goes on. You see that, how he did that with Israel all the time. That's, but he also applies to you as a believer. Okay, so the, finally and lastly, the elements of God's preservation, Psalm 40 and 11. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth Continually preserve me. So you've got three elements here. Thy tender mercies, thy loving kindness, and thy truth. That's all related to God's preservation. All right. All right. It's an open forum. If there's anybody got any questions, comments, and that sort of thing, we'll be here. And uh, let me uh, go ahead and close in prayer right quick. And we'll.